Praise the Lord. Okay. I want you to turn in your Bibles, please, to Luke's Gospel. Um, just going to look at a verse today, and we're going to compare some materials, some, some references today, and have a look. There's more of a teaching message today. I, I, I doubt whether I'll be as funny as Kevin was last week. Um, you know, but uh, it's, the, the jokes are great that he tells when you've heard them once. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've got my own back now. Okay. But if you can turn to, and I've, I've called this message I'm speaking on this morning, guys, if you can get the first um, slide on the screen. I've just got a couple of slides to show you. But um, this is called Shining the Light. And I want you to look at Luke 11.33, part of Jesus' teaching. I want you to realize Jesus was teaching in, in, in a very, very inspirational way. He wasn't teaching in an expositional way. He wasn't teaching, this is what you need to do, number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. He wasn't teaching that way. He was teaching in a very, a, 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 a very agricultural way, in actual fact. And he says, he says these words, No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket. Let me just have the next slide, please, guys. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden, um, is another version, but they put it on a lampstand so that those who come may see the light. Amen? Amen. Shining the light is not technical and complicated. It's pretty easy. It's about removing obstacles more than doing anything scientific and anything complicated. It's about not hiding what we have in Christ. Not suppressing what God has done for us in Jesus, but expressing what Jesus has done for us in our lives. Amen? But it's really, really important that we shine the light powerfully, but in the right way. And I'm going to give you an illustration in a moment. When we were in South Africa... Um, we had a, a, just, just an incredible time. I mean, we saw so much. I mean, I'm reliving every day. Um, I had to journal it because I forgot where I'd been, what I'd seen, everything else. And uh, even when I journaled it, I realized reading it back, I got it all mixed up. So I had to do it again when we came back just to get it in order. We, we traveled 6,000 kilometers. Um, Flo and I drove about 500 of those each, and Chris did the rest. Um, but it was just, uh, what a country, what a beautiful country. The vastness of it, the size of it. I've only been used to little England. I felt like I was living in a cul-de-sac when I got back. It was amazing. What a big country, full of variety. But one of the things we did is we went to a place called Cape Point. If you know Cape Point, Cape Point is one of the most treacherous coastlines in the world. It's near Cape of Good Hope that once the sailors have got to a certain place and got from one part of the sea to the next, they can all go, thank God for that. We survived. The Atlantic Ocean meets the Indian Ocean and currents and swells in the ocean are so dangerous, we saw a map of all the shipwrecks over the years and it was like dots everywhere. And it had the number of lives on each dot that was lost in that treacherous coastline. Unbelievable. The cold Atlantic meets the warm Indian Ocean and bang, you've got all sorts going on subsurface. And as you look, you can actually see the swells. And you think to yourself, swimming in that, no chance. You know, absolutely not. Even strong swimmers die and are drowned very often in those waters. And along those waters, there's, there's great white sharks. And yet there's still people out there on surfboards. Who, who, we saw people, you know, and people. I have a little magnet on my fridge that I brought back and it says, no swimming, great white sharks. And there's still people in the water. And you ask him, and you say, well, how come they're swimming? Well, it's like driving. Get People get killed on the roads, but they don't stop driving. I was like, I need to drive. I don't need to surf with great white sharks around, you know. So this is the kind of place. I'm, I'm painting the right picture for you. Okay, so you got it. Treacherous coastline. 
listen to this. This, this God really spoke to me about this. And I, I prayed over it, meditated over it, and mulled over it a lot. And, 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 and the, the, the lighthouse that we visited at Cape Point spoke to my life massively. And the, the, the lighthouse there was first built by Alexander Gordon, 1859. I must confess, when I read that, I thought, oh, the British. You know, just an element a little. Yeah, the Brits are here again, you know. And then I read the, the next bit and I thought, well, I'm, I'm not fully British. <laughs> because Alexander Gordon built the lighthouse something like 280, 290 meters above sea level. It was a fine structure, outstanding, very tall, very high. And it was one of the most powerful lighthouses of its day, if not the most powerful lighthouse of its day with 900, nearly 1,000 candle watt power, whatever that is, 1,000 candles or something anyway. And, and it shone for 63 miles. How awesome is that light shining? Shining the light so vast, so powerfully. But then I read the next bit. It was taken down because it was too high. And somebody else had to come and take the lighthouse down because it was so high, the clouds at that point were so vast and so dense, nobody could see the light. And as a result of it, in 1911, the SS Lusitania, the Portuguese, uh, a Portuguese liner, crashed on the rocks because it never saw the light that was shining. And the loss of life was unnecessary. I want to say to you this, this is the revelation I have. The light was shining but it was covered up because the lighthouse was too tall and it had its head in the clouds. Can I say that again? The lighthouse had its head in the clouds. People couldn't relate to what it was doing because it was too high, it was too far. People didn't see what should have easily been seen. And do you know what happened? They brought the lighthouse down to earth. Maybe not with a bump, but they brought it down where it could be visible. Because God so loved the world that he sent his son to this world. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we think because we become Christians, we could go to the high level and shine. Ain't nobody up there. They're all down here. And we need to be down-to-earth Christians if we want to win our generation for Jesus Christ. <laughs> Revelation was clear. Revelation, pie in the sky. Pie in the sky people don't win anybody but pie in the sky people. We need to, we need to realize that the real people need to see real witnesses. Real Christians who shine in a real and genuine way. Can I hear an amen? There was a canopy of cloud that blotted this out because geographically and positionally, it was in the right place. It was in the, in the coastline that there was the most dangerous, just where you needed a lighthouse, just where it was needed, just where it was necessary because it was most dangerous. The, tr the trouble is that while it was positioned correctly, it was too lofted and therefore was ineffective. In actual fact, there's a plaque. Next slide, please. It was called the Invisible Lighthouse. <laughs> I don't want to, I just want to inspire you today, please, by the grace of God, don't be an invisible lighthouse. Be a visible lighthouse in a promontory that God has placed you, in a position that God has placed you. You don't have to be high and lofted and up there in the clouds. In fact, don't be like that. Be down to earth. Get hold of God where you are. Where you are is God, where God will speak to you right where you are. You don't have to be somewhere grandiose for God to use you. This is a message I want to bring to you today. Are you listening, please? Um, 
It was called the Invisible Lighthouse. And do you know what the Lord said? I felt the Lord drop into my spirit. It's so easy to make ourselves invisible. When I am shining, when I am shining through you. you I remember, do you, every, anybody remember that rapper did at Christmas? Anybody, put your hand up if you remember the rapper did at Christmas a few years back. Do you remember? Oh, thank the Lord there's not many. I rapped on, at Christmas to raise funds for Romania. And do you know... Our Danny put it on YouTube. I can't believe that, Danny. You put, uh, you, you, he put it on you. And, and you know, because the way to the top is the way down. Ain't no mess and it's in the good book. If you don't believe me, just take a look because I'm just a preacher trying to reach you. Listen to the Holy Spirit. He'll teach you because the way to the top is the way down. Ain't no mess and it's in the good book. Because I'm just a preacher trying to reach you. Remember it now. You got a free version there, eh? Don't put that on YouTube, Danny. It's on, it's gone, all right. The way to the top is the way down. Very often we come to Christ and we think, oh, elevation is being up there. God does not want us to become detached and disconnected to the people that we work with, to the generations around us, to the people that we're speaking to every day. We need to interface with them, interact with them. We need to be there. We need to be in that community of people whereby we can bring the love and the mercy and the grace of Christ, not the judgment. Leave that to God. Leave that to God. Christians, we've got to get real. I I sat down and talked to a brand new convert a few weeks ago. I had coffee. And I said to him, and I I have this arrangement where I meet every month with them, just because God put on my heart that they need to be discipled and they need to put input in on a regular basis. And I've taken that upon myself. And I meet this person because I feel that God has not only won him to himself, to save him by his grace and his mercy, but that God wants to do something in his life and there's a call on his life and I can sense that call. And God showed me when I was in India, I was praying for this guy and God showed me him speaking and I went back, he was speaking in a white room. It wasn't a church, but it was related to a church and he was speaking, he was telling people what God had done in his life. And I went back to him and said, I was praying for you in India and you were speaking and and you were in this church, but it wasn't a church room. And he says, I can't believe it. I was in such and such a place the other week and I was telling people what Jesus had done. It was a white room and all of it. And I started talking to him and I started praying for him. And then he turned around and he said to me, I met with somebody the other week and they told me I had to do the seven Sabbaths. I thought, God help me. And God help him. He becomes a Christian, gives his life to Christ, and then somebody's talking to him about Sabbath. And, you know, guys, part of this word I'm bringing today is teaching, and it's correctional. Paul the Apostle says in Galatians 5.1, once you have become set free, don't go back. Don't go back to the law. Don't go back to legalism. Don't go back to the beggarly elements which once had you in bondage. Christ has set you free. Stay free. Stay free. Stay free. And I said to him, you do not need to become a Jew to become a Christian. He said, thank God about that because I read about circumcision. Anyway. (laughs) Praise the Lord. You know, I, let's keep it simple, let's keep it straight, let's keep, the, let's keep the, 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 the light in the right strata. Let's keep the light shining in the earth and down to earth in a way that really hits men and women uh, powerfully. Because there is no greater light than the light that was shone at Calvary. And I don't know about you, but in these days of technology, in, the, in these days of complexity, in these days where we seem to be more complicated than we've ever been. I don't know what it is about people who come to faith in Christ, they're all right for a few months and then they start to get complicated and they start to get theological and they start to get all tied up in all sorts of stuff and the next minute you know they're not saved just by grace, they're saved by a whole pile of other stuff as well. But I want to tell you this, where Jesus said it is finished, there was nothing could be added to that work. And we add things at our peril. And we add things that tie and bind us. We add laws. Listen, if you were saved by the love of God, don't bring in the law. Stop it. Legalism is tripping people up left, right and centre and spoiling the relationship that they have with the Heavenly Father. 
Don't let any religion spoil your relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't let it happen. Don't get political. Don't, don't let, let people judge you on these things. Sabbath days, holy days, all of these things. I want to say it because we're not called to be light to light. We're called to be light to darkness. Do you understand what I'm saying here, church? Yeah? This isn't scientific, what I'm preaching, is it? Amen? It, 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 it's, it's stuff that we need to know. God help me. I don't want to be an invisible lighthouse, Lord. I want to be a lighthouse that's seen. You know, while we were in South Africa again, I was able to take the Rubicon to people who didn't even know the Lord. I was, I was sat up one night. The guys had gone to bed. It was late. We had a long day. And I was sat at the bar. Don't you condemn me. I was, I was actually at the time, I was having an iron brew or something. Seriously, they weren't having an iron brew. They're having something much different. But I was talking to them about the Lord and the Rubicon. And one of them was kind of a Christian. The other one was definitely not a Christian. I could tell by his language. But rather than rebuke or be judgmental, I was able to speak into his life. And, 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 and we had an amazing conversation about Jesus Christ. It was amazing. And the book was used. When I got back, I had a telephone call on on, on, on Tuesday morning from a guy, we were here at the men's conference in January and I just felt the Lord say, go and give him a copy of the book, find his name, sign it and give it to him. And I went and I, I, I was on the table and I just, I just gave it to him, thought nothing else about it, he phoned me up the other day, He's absolute God's called him, has led him into a missionary position in Romania. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Because we teach what we know and we reproduce who we are. What Mag said there about we must pass on our spiritual DNA. You know, some of you people in here, you're going, you're going to become people with a, a heart for missions and a heart for the lost. Why? Because your pastors have. Did you hear me? Because your pastors have a heart for the lost. I, I don't have a heart for staying still, as people know. I don't have a heart for just self-building myself. I'm not interested in that. You know, when you go to the gym, you see all these muscly people. And they're all there. You can hear them from one side of the gym to the other. Oh! Oh! And I feel like, would you just be quiet a minute? I'm on my bike here. You know? Oh! Boom! Anybody hear that in the gym? You hear that? And there they are, ripples. Oh, and he's got nothing on me, you know, kind of thing. You know, look at my muscles, and they're all there, especially in front of the girls, hopefully not the boys, but they're all there, and they're all there, and they're building themselves up. But my answer, my question is, why? Apostle Paul says, build yourself up in the holy faith, but I want to know why. Why do you want to be a stronger Christian? Why do you want to be closer to Jesus? Why do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? To look good, to sound good, you have lost the essence of why you were called. Because to be built up is so that you are big enough to take what God has done out there. You are blessed enough. You are blessed enough. You have experienced God's generosity so much that you are going to give. You have experienced spiritual muscle not so you can show everyone your biceps or your abs. Or your six pack. I've got a two pack. <laughs> and you're not seeing it. In other words, there has to be purpose to everything that we do in Christ. There needs to be a purpose. And this is where people are getting lost these days. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you want to pray more, pray more, not just to pray more, so you can go around scoring spiritual points off people. That's legalism. And it's condemnatory and judgmental and is not endorsed by the Lord. Jesus said of the Pharisees, oh, how they love to pray. I'm going to speak about this a moment. Because I'm all guns blazing. Are you still with me? You might not be after this. Okay, Matthew 6. Okay, listen to this. Matthew 6. Where are we going here? Come on, Paul, get your act together. This is Jesus on prayer. I actually happen to think that Jesus is the best person to teach us on prayer. 
Anybody disagree with that? I don't think there's anybody who can teach prayer like Jesus taught it because, because he actually did it and modelled it. Now, this is what Jesus says about prayer. Not anybody else, Jesus. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray, standing in the churches or the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. But assuredly, I say to you, they've got their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room and shut your door and pray to your father who is in the secret place. Where is he? So why do we need to know about it? Who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetition as the heathens do. The actual heathen actually do this. For they think that they will be heard because they made lo make lots of long prayers and they pray for a long time, right? Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner then, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And we know what we've done with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, our Lord, amen. That Jesus never intended to happen. You understand what I'm saying here? I want, to do some, I want to put some teaching in this because I saw it from the lighthouse when I was at Cape Point and the Lord just kind of reminded me about being real, about being authentic. The amount of hours you pray does not show or reveal any authenticity whatsoever. It's not the amount of time you spend. It's not the amount you do. If you're going to tell everybody about it, you've lost your reward. What we do before God, we do before God is private and personal. And it's not for shouting out and putting out and all the rest of it. You can be shining your light at a wrong level. And we can be an invisible lighthouse by doing it. Authenticity does not come from that. Jesus actually showed in that that this is not what he's expecting. A relationship is not based on legalism. I know that there are people now in our church, and if they haven't prayed two hours a day, they, they feel like a second-rate Christian. It's a legalistic thing that you need to dispense with and get over. Prayer should be a lifestyle, not a moment or an hour or half an hour or anything like that. It should be a lifestyle. It was Smith Wigglesworth who actually said, I don't pray for more than 10 minutes, but I don't go 10 minutes without praying. Now that standard, I wouldn't say well, we have to all have that standard. It was Smith Wigglesworth. Prayer is a personal thing and it is relative to where you are, who you are, and you should never ever feel condemned through prayer. Prayer should never be used as a measuring stick or a punishing stick for somebody and say, you must do this and you must do that. And if you do that, you've made something that God never intended. It's legalism, formalism, and it's weak. It doesn't work. What it does is it makes people feel low, disconnected, and it ostracizes them. That's what it does. And I, I want to tell you that now, as a senior pastor of this church, I don't believe that's good practice. I don't believe it's biblical. I believe in prayer. Prayer is hugely important. But prayer takes on all kinds of shapes and sizes and variety. And we must pray. We must have a prayer life. But to say that you must do this, must do that, must do that, you're going by your own law. Jesus didn't do it. In actual fact, listen to this quote from, I think it was from Bill Johnson this week. If you want the applause of people, make your disciplines severe and make them public. If you want God's applause, make them private and make them personal. Can I just read that again? If you want the applause of people, make your disciplines severe and make them public. If you want God's, make them private and make them personal. People who, who, who parade their own prayer life and their own personal as some standard for you to come up to, this is wrong. Hear what I'm saying? It's wrong. I cannot put my experience and make it a standard for you. That is wrong. It's unfair. It's unreasonable. It doesn't make people grow. It doesn't make people in any way, shape or form feel better about themselves. It makes them feel low. It, makes, it almost disconnects them. So I'm, I'm teaching you that right now, okay? Um, it's really important that we get to grips with all of that. When Jesus came, he spoke about John the Baptist and he said about John the Baptist, who was, 
who, who came, he says, he's come from the wilderness, eating locusts, wild locusts and honey, and he's come from the wilderness, and you said he got a demon. I come drinking wine and eating with publicans and sinners, and he says, because Jesus actually was teaching them about how they measure spirituality and authenticity. And those measures don't work then, and they don't work now. And we, yet we still fall into that bracket of doing it. I want to tell you, God is a personal God. We always teach that God is a personal God, that Jesus is a personal Savior. Can we allow Jesus to be personal to the individual then? Can we do that? Instead of pushing our experience onto other people. Can we do that? Is that all right with everybody? Are you cool with that? I mean, anybody got a problem with that? It's a personal walk with God. God does not condemn you in your walk. God wants you to grow closer to him in your life with him, but that's about you and your personal walk with God, not somebody else setting a standard for your life. Can I say something about prophecy? Because we're hearing lots of words being given these days. Sometimes by people who say, this is what the Lord is saying, you're going you're gonna to win the lottery next year. Can't you make it a bit sooner, please? Listen, the Bible says, do not despise prophesying in 1 Thessalonians 5, but it says, weigh everything. And people are taking things hook, line and sinker, and it worries me and it concerns me. Years and years ago, in 2003, 2004, not quite sure when it was, but it's in the Rubicon. So a person came to me and he said to me, he came to my office afterwards and he said, I need a private word with you. Alarm bell's already ringing. I need a private word with you. This is what the Lord's saying. If you carry on the way you are, the church will be empty in 12 months. I said, well, that's wonderfully inspiring and encouraging for a start. So 12 months came and we, the church had almost doubled. So I saw the brother again in the service and I pulled him to one side afterwards. I said, can I have a word with you? He says, yeah, sure, Pastor. Yes. I said, sat him down. I said, right, now, this word that you said 12 months ago. What word, Pastor? I don't need to say any more than that. What word, Pastor? He'd forgotten what he said. I, I want to tell you this, friends. People who prophesy in the name of the Lord, they need to be responsible for what they say. They need to be accountable. I, I love a prophetic word. I've had prophetic words spoken over me. Uh, many times they've been liberating, they've been directional, they've been great. Again, I've written about it in the book, and I've had other stuff spoken over me. I'm, I'm being real here with you today. I've had stuff spoken, we've had stuff, Mags and I, over the years, and stuff. And sometimes it's not necessarily a leave it, it's not necessarily a take it, it's necessarily a weigh it word. And we've weighed it. And as things have transpired, they've been wrong words. And I've not connected with the people who said them again. Otherwise, I would have words. All I'm trying to say is, guys, we had a service while I was away here where people were giving words out. And one of the pastors got up and said, you need to weigh the word. Christians, we, 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 we want to be building strong Christians, Right? That means you have the right and you must weigh what you hear. Even if somebody says, thus saith the Lord. King James English doesn't make it any more authentic, right? It doesn't. Just because it's God speaking in the King James doesn't give it any more authority than if it was the Good News Bible. But, and yet, people do, people, when they say, thus Seth, it's like a Cecil B. DeMille's moment. Now, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm trying to get you to be a strong Christian, to weigh things, and, and, and realize that you have a personal walk with the Lord, okay? And you have a right to weigh things that are said over your life, and weigh them properly. Do not take them like a maggot on a hook, hook, line, and sinker. Don't do that. Um, uh, you know, and especially from people you don't really know. Particularly from people you don't really know. Absolutely, Christine, I would I, I endorse that completely, totally. Jesus said when he talked about John the Baptist in Luke 7, 33, if you went to Luke 7, 33, for instance, uh, if you did that for a moment, um, it, it's very interesting what Jesus says in 33. Um, 
just catch up with that for a moment. It, it, after he'd spoken about himself and John the Baptist, he, he says, listen, he says, John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. You say he has a demon. The son of man has come eating and drinking. And look, you say it's a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. In other words, what Jesus is saying, look, guys, when people speak, the measure is time. Because you don't have children just like that. Wisdom is justified by her children means the fruit will show what was at the root. Got it? So, so by just that statement, Jesus was actually saying, time. Time will tell. Time will show. Time, nothing else, not because somebody shouts with a loud voice or somebody speaks to you in King James English or anything else, but time will reveal. Okay? So I want us to go forward as a church and as individuals, never feeling condemned because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay? You're not under the law, you're under grace. If God wants you to do new disciplines, new things in your life, new constants in your life, that's great. Go and do them. Uh, I've had that happen to me many times. Just a few years ago, about two years ago, I, I had a discipline that I was doing for six years. And God led me out of it because it became a legalistic thing. I was doing it for the wrong reason. Motive is very, very important in all we do at the end of the day. Praise the Lord. Are you still with me? Are you still happy, chappies? Amen. So I want to just bring this to a conclusion because it's a teaching word. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, test all things, weigh all things, um, realize that people will, have, will be held to account for the words that they speak. They forget so easily what they've said, but they will be held to account. Um, but we need to understand um, that the Lord doesn't expect us just to listen and hear everything that everybody says. How many want to be a great witness today? How many want to shine brightly in the right way? In the right way. At the right level. Praise God. I don't care. Listen, if God has to take us down a wee bit so that we shine more effectively, would anybody say amen to that? If God has to just get us to lower ourselves and get our head out of the clouds a wee bit, are we up for that? Father, you see, I'm saying... Be real. Be genuine. Be you. You are unique. Never become a copy. Never try to become a copy. You're an original. And God made you that way. The last thing I want to bring up is the slide. Shining opportunities. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shining opportunities. Opportunities for shining. Okay? African praise night, like Delhi said. Whoa! <laughs> who's going who's gonna to shine that night? I want to see some people dancing. <laughs> oh, oh, I got it down below. Oh, oh, I got it down below. Come on. And with Mahari. Come on. We're going to be there that night. Pastor, come. My laugh is coming. Hello. Uh, 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 uh. Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, can we just, can we just, uh, can we just, uh, can we kneel? Pastor, can we, can we kneel? Uh, uh, love it. It's going to be here. Praise God. I saw him the other day at his 50th. We went to his 50th birthday. Wow, what an experience that was. Hallelujah. It's still, still going on now. <laughs> African night of praise is going to be wonderful. And we are, the money we're raising, we're going to put towards the message trust. African projects in South Africa. Whoa! 
Spoke to Andy Hawthorne the other day as well. He's, he's on the ceiling with that. That's fantastic. Um, Sunday night. Where's young Jess? Oh, he's upstairs, isn't he? Excel. Two people. Two people. <laughs> Egg, listen, I haven't finished. Excel with 12.24. Yeah, 12.24 are coming. We bring you 12.24. We're good to you. We're so good to you. I tell you, I, listen, it's not, it's not just good for the youth. When I, when I, if God spares me until I'm 82 and I'm mobile, I'm going to be... 12.24. Stay youthful. Rigor mortis sets in far too quickly if you don't. 5th of July. You got it, Marie. Yeah, yeah. Party in the park. Shining opportunities. When you go there, don't have your head in a cloud. Yeah. Be speaking. Be available to speak to people. Go and speak to people. Don't suppress it. Express it. Hallelujah. Then there's another great opportunity. 11th of August to the 25th Romanian Mission. We are starting a new church. We're going to make history for the kingdom in Jesus' name. We're going to start new generation church where young people can come and find the Lord and, and serve him and walk in blessing without being criticized and judged and every five minutes. Praise God. So excited about that. Hallelujah. So, last one, guys. Are you with us? Come on, stand with me a moment, please. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Father, come on, I want to pray for you specifically today. I want to pray. You know, God is not looking for you to be a super Christian with a big S on the front of your shirt. God is just looking for you to be you and wants, to, wants you to know that he's your heavenly father. Praise the Lord. Has, has this made any of you come out of a little bit of feeling a bit, mm, I'm no good? Anybody, anybody, just anybody feel like that this morning, that that's helped them in that respect? Just put your hand up and show me. It's important for me. That's great. That's really great. I want you to know that the Lord loves you as much as he loves anybody else. The Lord's not here to you, for you to score points off people or anybody else off you. The Lord loves you. You have a personal relationship with him. That's what's most important. God wants to know you more, love you more. And you want, you know, he knows you want to love him more. He wants to have that connection with you. Lift up your, your, your voice a moment. Will you do that? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I just want to pray into all of that. I'm going to pray into all of that. Lord, we've got loads of prayer opportunities, even tonight, Lord. We, we've got the opportunity to come and pray. So important, that is. We've got the opportunity to pray together. We've got the opportunity to pray together on Thursday evening. We can't be forced to do that, Lord. But Lord, I just pray that we'll want to come out of relationship to honour you, to bless you, to commune with you. Let it not be a legalistic thing, oh God, but let it be a love thing. Let it be a love thing, oh God, from our hearts. Because those who are forgiven much love much. And you have forgiven us so very much. Who knows that God's forgiven them a lot this morning? Praise you, Jesus. Do you love him a lot? Hallelujah. Tell him that right now, will you? Love you, Lord. Father, we love you, Lord. Anybody want to say they love the Father? Father, we love you. Because you first loved us when we were unlovable. Nothing about us. Lord. You don't love us anymore because we sing more, pray more preach more you can't love us any more than you do you love us with an everlasting love pure love how great is the Father's love how great is the Father's love
Behold, says the scripture, what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called the sons and daughters of the living God. He's lavished it upon us. Poured it out over us. Thank you, Jesus. We can't attain it. We can't earn it. We can't merit it. But you've given it to us through your precious Son, Jesus. And we bless you, Lord. Come on, bless him a moment. Bless him a moment, church. Bless him a moment. Yes. Yes. Yes, Lord. Lord, we pray for all the youth upstairs. We pray for the teachers upstairs. Lord, in light force, and we pray that they will be blessed, oh God, with truth and blessed, oh God, with your word, oh Lord. Thank you for your precious word. Thank you for your wonderful word that lives in us, that gives us breath that gives us life, oh God, that gives us liberty. Father, help us not to step back into bondage once we've been set free. Help us to live and live free in the freedom that you've given us. In Jesus' name.